Modern Hero Podcast. Igniting both the art and the science of functional medicine. Here's your host, Dr. Brad Watts. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast today. I'm Dr. Brad Watts. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for joining the next episode. Today, I have a special guest, a friend of mine named Sierra Cullen, and she has an amazing story. I wanted to talk about her story. I want to talk about some of the trials and tribulations, and then ultimately, some of the resolution that uh, she made happen. And let's be honest, she made it happen. You're going to hear her story, and uh, and I think you're going to be inspired by it. Additionally, the thing I want you to get out of this podcast more than anything is a patient perspective. She is going to be talking about how she felt going through being a patient, like how she felt going through a healthcare journey as a patient with doctors that couldn't listen to her, wouldn't listen to her, uh, and otherwise. And so you're going to hear that. I want you to get this. I want you to see what some of the magic was that helped her turn the curve, it helped her move her health in the right direction, and uh, and you'll see that it's a combination of nutrients, nutrition, support, lifestyle changes, some procedural uh, situations from a medical perspective that helped her turn the curve, and then also this thing between her ears. She has gone on a pretty interesting journey at making sure that she is the one in control of her health. Super proud of her. Without any further ado, welcome, Miss Sierra Cullen. Miss Sierra Cullen, welcome to the Nutrition Hero Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Dr. B. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. I thought about it the other day and I told my wife, I said, I'm going to text her and I'm going to see if she would be willing, if she would be willing to share her story, if she'd be willing to like communicate some of the things that she learned along the way and sure enough you were so I appreciate it <laughs> and not only that uh, you had texted me in the morning and about 10 hours before I had told my sister I really think I should do a podcast with Dr. B we were- <laughs> <laughs> this is- right on there <laughs> right on the same wavelength you gotta love it <laughs> so well cool so um, for the audience what I want to basically do is I want to uh, just get what some of your backstory is and and what it was like uh, being a, a patient, so to speak, being in a patient mindset and and th- and that type of thing. So let's let's start with your story in like two minutes or less. Where do you feel like is the best place to inform people of where you were? And then we can talk about where you are and all the fun stuff. Okay. Where I was, that's more than a two minute story, but um, (laughs) I am the incredibly, I am the incredible um, inflating and deflating human being. Uh, I'm 39 years old and I have gone through tremendous um, weight swings throughout my life. Um, Some of it I would say is, you know, genetic. However, um, I was definitely dealing with some form of food addiction, um, unhealthy eating as well. Um, and in 2014, I had lost my job, which at that time was my identity. I didn't know who I was, right? I had put all of my eggs into the basket of identifying this is who I am professionally. I had this amazing job. Well, that went away instantly. I was laid off from a very successful corporate career. And because I didn't have that foundation, um, and I found myself for the first time in my life, unemployed, having to rely on my husband. Uh, I started turning to my greatest ally at the time, and that was food. Um, so, the- to what extent? Yeah. To what extent um, was your relationship with food skewed like that? Like you mentioned that you had a you know some food addiction. What was that like? Like what was your relationship like at that time? Sure. Well, as with any addiction, no matter what it is, uh, you can't get enough. So you, it's a drug. So you wake up in the morning and you need to fill a hole. And, you know, looking back on it, having a lot of therapy and going through this journey, like I did finally identify I had to fix the, the heart of the problem. It is It was a mental thing. Um, but uh, as I ate more, I gained more, I craved more. Obviously, I understand the you know, the chemical processes that happens with the body, insulin spikes and things like that. Sure. So, um, yeah, so I, I was basically, I, 
I wasn't anorexic. I was not bulimic. I was a chronic binge eater. So as soon as I would get done with the first meal, I started um, getting anxious uh, very shortly after I ate for the next meal. So it wasn't uncommon for me. I never counted calories, but I would say on average to be covering anywhere from five to 10,000 calories a day um, and just self-medicating. And the more I ate, the more invisible I felt I became. The bigger I became, uh, the more uh, I hid away from um, you know, social events, you know, my, my friends started pulling away from me because I was just rejecting everyone and everything uh, because I had no self-worth and the food was the only thing that was giving me comfort. How long do you feel like you were in that spot? Was it just from 2014 on or did it happen? Like, was this something that you've been dealing with for like 20 years just under the surface? Sure, I, I definitely think there was some form of abuse going on um, to some extent. But like I said, food wasn't always the main focus in my life because sure. I, I was so involved in so many other things. I'm a very social person. I, I always had a lot of friends, a lot of, you know, I always had a lot going on. Um, yeah. But like I said, when I had this, you know, professional quote unquote tragedy at the time, um, that's basically where I just hold myself away. Um, so I would say the worst of it was from 2014 to early um, 2018, as early okay. as, as early last year. But when you talk about your body weight going up and that type of thing, how much, when you talk five to 10,000 calories, it doesn't take long to start adding on a pound here and there very right. often. And, and so how at your highest, how, how, if you don't mind talking about it, how high were you versus where you felt like you should be? Sure. So I don't have info on my body fat percentage, but um, I'm 5'10", uh, and I got up to, at my highest, uh, 284 pounds. Okay. That's where I had tipped the scale. And I had ranged anywhere between, in my adult life, 160 to, you know, early, low 200s, I would say. So it, I gotcha. put on that amount of weight. I probably put on a good 80 pounds within a matter of uh, two years easily. Gotcha. Gotcha. When you, when you felt like you're starting to pull away from your social engagements and when she says she's social as she's not really giving it the, the proper context here, I mean like one of the most social people I've ever met. <laughs> so um, when we, when you talk about pulling away from your friends and you talk about um, and basically turning inward or hiding, as you mentioned, what is that like and and do you think it's a normal process people go through or do you think that it was just unique like the people listening to this podcast is this something that a lot of their patients are going to go through or is this something that is rare i would be shocked if this wasn't 90 plus percent of their patients okay. the reason why their their patients probably aren't talking to them about it is that it's humiliating you know, nobody wants to admit, you know, they're hiding away and, you know, they feel like they don't matter anymore. Uh, typically, you know, I've, I've been to many doctors in my life, some good, some bad. And I, I was never comfortable, you know, addressing it with my doctor because we were always just talking about the, the stats, right? We were always talking yeah. about the, we were always talking about the blood test. We were always talking about the diet. But I think that there is definitely an opportunity for doctors to actually start asking meaningful questions about the daily behavior and the daily thought pattern that's going on in their patients' lives because it, it, it matters and it's ultimately that invisible engine that is driving this, you know, chronically destructive behavior. The, it's, it's, the experience of that. Um, when you're sitting in front of a doctor and the doctor is talking about the stats or the surface issue things, what is it like sitting there and and looking at them and, and understanding that there's something they're not touching that you know in your heart of hearts is actually one of the things that needs to get handled? What is that like? Well, it definitely makes you feel isolated. You know, like they sometimes you just feel like a number. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you just feel like you go in and, and, and it's not out of bad intention. I don't believe I think they're doing their job and taking the boxes, but I think it, it feels very isolating. And the more that I don't, I feel, I felt misunderstood, the more I pulled away. So I got gotcha. to the point, 
that is just strictly answering the questions asked. Right. You know what I mean? Whether, you know, maybe I felt that they wouldn't understand or maybe I felt like they weren't the type of doctor I should be talking to. I should sure. just be therapy. But I think there's definitely more opportunity for people to be engaging in these conversations. See, this is interesting to me because one of the things that uh, as a provider is that you hope comes across is your desire to help people. But there's this other side where if somebody doesn't trust you, I can understand where they would withhold information. Not necessarily like, you know, they might not even know that it's important information, right? But that that place where if there's a thing that's causing a problem or at least contributing to the problem, and we're not able to discuss it, that handicaps the ability of the teamwork between doctor and patient to move in the right direction. And so I think this is super valuable to hear this just from that perspective alone. So I appreciate the openness that we're discussing this with because that's a big deal, a really yeah. big deal. So when you talk about um, shutting down or withdrawing from your friends, one of the things that happens in like the psychology world is that it becomes very me focused. And and I don't wanna mean like from a selfish perspective, but become focused on your body or yourself or what other people think of your body or you or your personality and that type of thing. Because I think isolated, I think in Netflix and, and hot chocolate. <laughs> right? But that's my version of isolated. I'm not thinking about anything other than what's on the TV in front of me. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Right, well, a lot of, a lot of that isolation issue is just a feeling of feeling different all the time. And I think it's interesting that you were talking about um, that it does become selfish because for most people, right, they walk into a grocery store and they just go get their groceries. They're just focused on the task or uh -huh. they get on an airplane and they're sitting in, an, in their seat and they just go wherever they need to go. It's much different, um, particularly being obese, uh, when you're already walking into it, like everyone's looking at me, everybody's judging me, I feel miserable, I can't walk, I, you know, it, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it brings me to my knees even thinking about it, it brings tears yeah. to my eyes, because those simple executions in daily life are so much different uh, mm -hmm. when you're obese and when you're hyper-focused on yourself. Um, there are so many painful moments. I mean, one in particular, like I said, would be sitting at a booth in a restaurant or sitting on an airplane seat where I'm pushing my arms and legs so far into my body where I'm getting atrophy sitting on a flight because sure. I'm so nervous that the, you know, the quote unquote regular person next to me is going to, you know, I'm going to be in their personal space. You know, I'm, I'm just constantly trying to navigate, you know, how to work with this ever growing body and what I perceive to be a, a, a world of, of normal weight people. And, and you know, I live in, and I'm not, I'm not trying to diss any part of the country whatsoever, but I'm from Southwest Florida. It's beautiful year round. People are always right. you know, fit and, you know, not that there aren't people with significant health issues, but I live in a very healthy culture where I live. So it, that was, for me was amplified. You know, originally I'm from the upper Midwest where I could just put on four layers and, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't make any difference because I could wear a size four parka and, you know, just yeah. look like, you know, um, but it, it was much different. <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, no, but, that's great. Yeah. That's great. You're exactly right. Um, when you are sitting in the middle of a health condition, why do you think that the focus becomes on yourself, but really about what everybody else thinks of you? Because you're sitting on the other side of it now, and do you feel the same way? Like, do you walk into a room and wonder, oh, everybody's looking at me, that type of thing? No, absolutely not. And and I always say, favorite word is the same letter. It's I. People want to talk about I, I, I. All. So if you have a mindset where people are just constantly focused on your weight or your health condition, even though they might not be, that's yeah. going to be every single facet of your actions um, throughout the day. So, Gotcha. Yeah. Wow. Um, your journey takes an interesting turn uh, a few years ago. You lost a bunch of weight from a nutrition perspective and, and you plateaued and, and, then, and then things got really interesting. So let's talk about your journey, like the way out of where you had been. Um, All right. You started losing weight. You started working on some nutrition, uh, balancing different things and hormones, et cetera. 
how far did you get with that? And then how did you end up um, going through the process uh, ongoing? Yeah, so I, I'm extremely blessed. I have I come from a family of um, uh, people in healthcare that they have taught me a tremendous amount about how to eat. Um, that was never really an issue for me. So I was having really great uh, results when I was actually applying myself with proper nutrition and supplementation. Um, that was about, I'd say, 2017. So in perspective, that's that's about three years after I had started, you know, really going into the hardcore into the food addiction. So, so the food planning actually worked to help the body weight come off, but did it fix any of the things that were going on inside your mind that were driving the issue? Absolutely not. No, it didn't. And that was, that was my issue. So I'm, I might get a little long on this answer and I might okay. be jumping to the next segment, but I do want to share something really interesting. Um, so I lost weight. Um, and then I had gained it all back because I didn't fix the source, right? I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't fix the driving engine of my mind. I always just, at the, and I just started, you know, gaining weight again, giving up on myself, saying, "Well, I guess I'm destined to be the fat girl," you know, just mm -hmm. that. That's I just gave up. So I put on, put most of the weight back on. Then in early last year, January of last year, I just finally had decided to look into the gastric sleeve uh, procedure and uh, I ended up doing it. Um, and it was terrifying, but it was, it was a great, um, I had one of the best doctors in the world uh, working on me and at no side effects whatsoever. It was great. Mm -hmm. The reason why, what I wanted to address is I'm an avid reader. Okay. And I recently read a book by Amy Cuddy, who is a psychologist um, and has been part of Harvard um, for, for many, many years. And she wrote a fascinating book called Presence. And she's also done, I believe, a TED Talk as well on presence. And the book is fascinating for anyone that hasn't read it. It's one of the best books I ever uh, read. She basically, it's, it's chock full of, um, you know, Harvard-backed research, a lot of science and what she was saying is that even though most of the time we think that the mind drives the body, uh, psychologists have proven over and over again that it's actually the opposite. The body, the physical, has the, has the, um, has the ability to drive the mind. I recently read that and I was really fascinated. And it goes back to what I'm saying about the surgery because... Yeah. I had to physically, now this is me, I'm not going to sit here and say gas, the gas, you know, gastric procedures yeah. for everyone, but I'm saying what, what my biggest learning, and when you and I talked this summer, I really didn't mention this because it really didn't, I, I, I didn't get it, but I had to physically change my anatomy to be able to lose weight, not because of the, you know, the scientific reasons, yeah. but as soon as you removed my ability to take in my drug, what happens? Yes, I'm going to lose weight initially. That's going to happen. But what happens is that everyone that goes through this surgery, most of them develop PTSD. They need their drug and you're forced to actually then change your mind. So before, right? right? So what I'm saying is that before I would diet or I would exercise, but I still had the ability to take in my drug. Okay. When that was removed, when, you know, over half of my stomach was removed and I was on a liquid diet, I plummeted into this crazy psychotic depression because I was, I was grasping for my food. Where's my drug? Right. And when that was removed, it forced my hand to say, okay, the, the slate is clean now. Now you're going to go fix your mind. And I actually found an amazing therapist down here and I started going to therapy and I started actually being able, my physical being altered actually drove the change in mentality. That was tremendously key for me. I, it was everything because for the first time in my life, I can honestly say I have a healthy relationship with food. For me personally, I don't think that would have ever changed had I not gotten the surgery. So yeah, I think that's awesome. I think one of the things that you're talking about specifically is amazing. Like your DNA, I think we've talked about this in the podcast before, but your DNA is basically an encyclopedia, a record book of all of your experiences, emotional and otherwise, and has the ability to submit information to your brain, causing a response. And so when we're trapped in that cycle, 
it oftentimes does take a physical thing in order to get out of a mental circumstance. And it's amazing to be able to see that on the other side. Because when you're in it, there's almost no way to see what your way out of it. Almost no way. And, and so what's interesting is you took a risk, right? Calculated, but you took a risk and that risk paid off, right? You trusted the process that this doc was presenting to you. And, and I'm excited about that for you because ultimately, where has it put you now and how long has it been? So as of, so I had the surgery in March, early March of last year. So I'm not, I'm about a year and a half out. Yep. Um, so today I have lost 115 pounds. I'm at 19% body fat and um, I've kind of become this athlete that I never knew I, I could be. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, this is amazing because the only reason that that's possible is because it was in there the whole time. Right. right? True. True. That's the only reason it's possible. And what's interesting to me is, is that you never met that person. Yeah. That's, it's it's, and it's beautiful. It's a, an amazing thing to see happen, but I can't imagine it's got to be amazing to experience. <laughs> it is. And one of my favorite sayings is that the con what, what the conscious mind sees can never be unseen. So once, mm -hmm. you know, this has not been an easy process to say, no. oh, you know, people have these preconceived notions when you go through these types of times, these types of surgeries that think, oh, this is just, a, you know, you're just yeah. doing this the fad but that's not the case at all um it's 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 a daily journey it's a daily battle but to your point as you tackle each day it just gets a little bit easier you know it, it's just there's good and bad days but you just have to continually go back go back go back consistency you know guarantees results you know so absolutely and and so to me the amazing part is is that this new you has been in there the whole time. It's just covered up by a bunch of things that are clearly unhelpful. And, um, and I think it's a, a testament to the power of the human spirit, but it's also a testament to getting sick of being sick. Oh my gosh, yes. So, yeah. and it's awesome. I'm like super proud of you because looking at it, you go, <laughs> it's amazing. It's just, it's amazing. <laughs> so amazing um one of the things that i get excited about is when people take what they've learned and they start delivering it to others and and uh and for you this mindset situation like you basically you've just been lit on fire here and and it's spawned a new career for you and it, like focus and oh my gosh well i, I it, it's kind of the universe kicking me in the butt to be quite honest i <laughs> I said my background is in fashion. You know, I took some time off. Right now, I've just been helping my husband, um, working by myself behind the computer. Uh, mm -hmm. A few months ago, which is what we talked about this summer, a few months ago, one of my friends came to me. She was on the chair for um, uh, Naples Art Association. It's a, it's a philanthropic organization here where I live. And she was like, you know what? I, I'm on this committee. I'm, I'm in charge of running all these things. And they need an MC for their Couture Runway Show, which is their biggest fundraiser of the year. And it's coming up in a few weeks. Or I'm sorry, it's coming up in November. Uh -huh. And she was like, they wanted a, a, a celebrity. They wanted like a newscaster, somebody to MC the whole event. But nobody's going to do it but you. You're the perfect person for it. So what <laughs> the old me, right? The, the, the hibernating me came out immediately was terrified, said, no, 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 no. So uh, basically six weeks went on, I drug my feet. I told her I'll be your backup plan. I did everything to hide because this is what I'm saying. Even though I've made so many strides, you know, you still have that, those, those same mentalities that kind of still have that residual effect. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm still dealing with, I'm still dealing with that. Um, and, and, it's, and, I, and it's, and it's, I just have to remind myself every day you know, who I actually am, but what I see in the mirror and what other people see is still very different. You know, it's, it's hard for the, the brain to catch up uh, with the body. But anyway, long story short, 
I accepted this position and it's, that's actually a funny story in and of itself because when I first accepted with the committee, I said, okay, um, I will speak, but uh, I want you to hide me away in the back by the DJ. Oh, we can do that. We can do that. We're going to put you in the back. Okay. So then the next meeting would go on and they would say, oh, CR, no, you need to come introduce the executive chair at the beginning of the runway show. Oh, really? So I'm freaking out, but I got to play it off. Right. So then the next meeting, there's like, oh, I want you to lead. I want you to host on um, the after party. And then the next meeting said, I want you to lead off all of the models. I'm thinking, what in the world? What what is my life? What did I actually get myself? <laughs> um, so what that, you know, what the original proposition of this role was in July is certainly not what it is today. So in two weeks, I will be um, hosting the event. I will be hosting the after party. I wrote the scripting. I did the music. Um, and this is all very, very new to me, even though I'm yeah. in corporate fashion. Um, I'm around, I, I just, I've been propelled into the spotlight. And it's very ironic because I, it was always something that terrified me so much. And that's what one thing that you, you know, amazing resource for me this summer and just helping me to, you know, gain a little bit of confidence because when you're constantly identifying as this past person and now you're this new person, sometimes it can be hard to reconcile. You know what I mean? Like what, what I'm actually capable of doing, even though I've conquered so many things in my health journey, I still have all of these, you know, underlying insecurities, but I do feel like, you know, it's a destiny thing. This is a yeah. huge part of the journey and it's a critical part of my journey because I, I can prove to myself that not only can I come out of hibernation, but I can be in the spotlight. When we, when you look at what your brain wants to do versus your mind wants to do your consciousness, uh, it, it definitely, they fight against each other. Okay. Yeah. Your brain is just like a, a tool, but your consciousness uses your brain to accomplish all those different things that you were just talking about. Yes. Okay. So what happens is that your body's tied to your brain. However, you're, your consciousness is tied to your body, not the other way around. Okay, so your body's tied to your brain. Your consciousness is tied to your body. When you look at, at being able to overcome fear and, and all of these things, one of the biggest things I ever read that I thought was the most fundamentally like, truth in dealing with fear is to understand that it's just a thing. It's not actually who you are. It's a thing. Yeah. It's like a rock in your shoe. And if you can step back when your body starts to feel fear, when you feel that anxiety start to build up, if you can step back and just look at it as a thing and you don't have to identify as the fear, what happens is, is that you actually look for it. Like you're actually looking to experience it once again because it becomes less and less over time. And as you continuously look to experience it at some point, you're going to walk up on stage and you're just going to stand there and be like, it's not there. Where'd it go? Right? Because it was never a part of you to begin with. It's just a thing. It's like a, like a virus, right? It's a thing. And so I just, I wanted to throw that out there for you because as you think about going on stage or doing presentation, et cetera, um, you, you can make your blood pressure go up. You can get anxiety just sitting in your house, Right. And, and it doesn't need to be like that. It, it's ultimately, um, you know, it, it's just this, this external thing that's not who you are. And, and when you look at it as such, you take away its power. And it's pretty cool. So. It's so true. It's, it's really about, yeah, it's really about identifying. I can't, I had to stop identifying myself as fear. I, I told myself I am fear and I felt obligated to yeah. feel fear. Honestly, why do we do that? Why do we feel yeah. obligated to feel fear? We Because we almost feel guilty if we don't feel fear. And it's I'm still working. Dr. B, I need you to share with your listeners, because I think about it all the time, what you told <laughs> me to go about the analogy about being at the doorway. Remember you said if you were in my house and you felt fear. Do you remember that or do you want me to tell? I don't remember that. You can go ahead. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, I had come to you saying, you know, I really feel called in public speaking, but I'm terrified. You know, I, I couldn't reconcile the fact that I knew I had a gift in something that also terrified me. And it's, it goes along the lines of what you were saying about fear. You said, Sierra, 
if I'm in my house and every morning you walk in my front door and you just start screaming at me. You're emotionally violent, you're swearing, you're intimidating, you're waving your arms, and I know I have to get out of my house every day, but I know I have to pass you. I have a couple of options. The first option is I can stay in my house because I'm so terrified of you and you're standing at the door and I can't, I can't make it through that threshold, or I can just simply observe it, listen to you, but just walk past you. You know what I'm saying? And just walk out of the door. That's how fear is. It's, it's this invisible wall in reality. It doesn't actually exist to your, to your point, but from a fear standpoint, it feels like Alcatraz. It feels like this huge stone wall that you're never going to be able to get through. And going back to the analogy, you said, if you walk through the door, you'll come back the next day. Even, even though the fear is still going to be there, just keep walking past, just keep walking past, just keep walking past. And that to me, I really identified with that because it was so much of it was just this false wall fear in this process for me. What I'm finding is that the more I tackle fear, the more I take risks, the fear doesn't get lessened. The fear actually amplifies. However, it gives me so much strength to know, well, I'm stepping through a bigger fear today. I always thought, you know, if I were to go through, oh, the fear is going to go away eventually. I'm just going to keep doing it. And maybe it will go away eventually. But what I'm finding is <clears throat> with each step in the process and keep going, it does give me a lot of, you know, confidence to keep going. Does that make sense? I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, it makes sense. A hundred percent. And, yeah. and, uh, usually what happens is, is fear is as big as you make it. And if you stop looking at it, it stops getting bigger. So that's cool. Yeah. All right. So as we move toward wrapping this up here, one of the things that um, I feel like is missing in modern healthcare is being able to understand where the patients are at without leaving them there. And, and it's a skill set, I think, and un- unbelievably, people that have gone through interesting health experiences usually have the ability to do this for other people, but not for themselves. They can see where people are at, help them move forward. And, and like, just because they love them. Right. And as healthcare providers, it's a skill that most people don't have because you're not taught it in school. It's like a skill of being a good person (laughs) more than having a brain full of biology. Mm -hmm. And, and there's this thing um, that I wanted to talk about. You had mentioned previously, you had one of the best doctors in the world working on this procedure you had done. What about this guy made him one of the best doctors in the world? Okay. Am I allowed to say his name? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Uh, it's Dr. Ariel, Ariel Ortiz and he is out of, um, obesity control. So he's incredible. Um, what makes him amazing? Well, technically, he's he's phenomenal, but I'm going to give you some of the intangibles. That's what um, I'm looking I, for. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example. When I first had looked into the surgery, I went to a, I guess, reputable um, bariatric clinic in Fort Myers, Florida, and they, I, I was going to go along with it, but I was going to be a cash patient. Um, I was, I didn't have much for insurance at the time, and I was basically told. <laughs> I was basically told by this local clinic, you know, what are you doing? You're ruining your life. You're a young woman. You're going to mess up your anatomy for life. So I was very, very intimidated. I almost didn't go through with it. Let me tell you something. The clinical experience that I had at this clinic was unparalleled to anything I've ever experienced in my entire life. I absolutely hate going to the doctor. It terrifies me. And being there, I felt number one understood. Number two, there was an amazing sense of community. So they had a great social media presence. They were following up with me on all of my pre care almost every single day. Um, they they were almost like offering counseling to me before I even started. These people were actually identifying with their patients, saying, "We get where you're coming from. We understand your fear," and they did everything in their power to you know put my mind at ease. The one thing for me that was so incredible is that this man does not have to, he has a board of, of surgeons, you know, that execute surgeries as well. In addition to him, 
and he came into every single patient's room, took pictures, gave hugs, just had a, a human to human conversation. And honestly, that's always been my beef mm. with Doc is that there's no sort of humanity to your point. They, they know every fact in the world, right? They're great on paper. And so much is about just caring. Like you said, having some sort of touch of spirit, the spirit and humanity around you. I bet that changed the game for me. I had never experienced in my entire life, particularly a surgeon, particularly a famous surgeon that would come in and just put his hand on my shoulder and say, everything's going to be, everything's going to be okay. Because if, if, when I saw that he was confident, when I saw that he was grounded, when I saw he was just showing his presence with me, it just gave me this feeling like, wow, you know what? I don't have to die in this addiction. Like in those moments, I, I just realized like there could be hope, you know, it seems so far at this moment, yeah. but energy transfers so easily. And I think so many doctors fail to take that into consideration, right? Cause they're just trying to diagnose, treat, but they're not, they're, they're never addressing the intangible of just being a human. That's right. So, and that ultimately that's, that's why I wanted to hear your story again today is because that perspective is so valuable. Like you can't, you can't charge for that perspective. You can't teach that perspective. Like most people have it. They just train it out of themselves when they're in school. And, um, and so it's, it's amazing to be able to highlight that, that that's actually a difference maker. So, man, thank you for doing this, by the way. This is fun. Yeah, I, I had a great time. Thank you. You were a good host.